Good evening, virtual audience, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I am so delighted to introduce this event with Jana Levin, discussing her latest book, Black Hole Survival Guide, joined tonight by Harvard's own Shep Doleman. Before I turn things over to Dr. Doleman to introduce this event, I just want to make, to make a few housekeeping remarks. This is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science-related literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. And this is actually our last Science Book Talk of 2020, which I both hate to say, and also am relieved to say, because that means 2020 is almost over. But we are already hard at work lining up science talks for January onward, which we hope to announce soon. To learn more when these are announced, you can sign up for the bookstore's email newsletter at harvard.com, or you can visit the webpage harvard.com slash science. And as I always say, we also have a science research public lecture series YouTube page where you can see any previous talks that you might have missed. This evening's event is going to conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask Dr. Levin or Dr. Doleman something, please go to the Q&A chat at the bottom of the screen where you can submit a question. We're going to get through as many as time allows for. Also, once the event begins, I'm going to post a link in the chat to purchase tonight's featured book, Black Hole Survival Guide. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so a huge thank you for your support. Your purchases and contributions, I, there is a cat here, hello. I will also be dropping a donate link in the chat, make this virtual author series possible, and now really truly ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you to our partners at Harvard University, and thank you to all of you for tuning in and showing up for our authors, indie book selling, and especially for science, because it really matters. Finally, as you might've experienced in virtual gatherings the last few weeks, Technical issues can arise, and if they do, we're going to do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you for your patience and your understanding. And now I am honored to turn things over to Harvard astronomer Shep Doleman, director of the Event Horizon Telescope and assistant director for observation of the Black Hole Initiative. Named one of Time's 100 most influential people of 2019, he led the international research team that captured the first ever image of a black hole. So Shep, the digital podium is all yours. Okay, thank you very much, Kate. Um, it's a real delight to introduce uh, Professor Jana Levin tonight. I've known Jana for 32 years, ever since we were first year graduate students together at MIT back in 1988. And for all that time, I have been in awe of the breadth of her scholarly work. Uh, Jana dives deep into the theory of how the universe works at the most fundamental levels. She's become a world expert and published widely on topics including the glow of radiation from the Big Bang, alternative theories of gravity, gravitational waves, and of course, black holes. In a recent paper, Jana and her colleagues explored whether a neutron star in orbit around a black hole could charge up what she calls a black hole battery a powerful cosmic circuit that radiates energy as these two stellar cinders circle each other. She's always at the frontier. In addition to her research, Jana is an internationally renowned author and storyteller who translates the mysteries of physics for us, explaining the histories, the characters, the theories, and the drama of how real people struggle to uncover truth in the universe. Her books include How the Universe Got Its Spots, Black Hole Blues, and other songs from outer space, and A Madman Dreams of Turing Machines, for which she won the Penn Bingham Literary Prize. Jan is the Claire Tao Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Barnard College of Columbia University. She's a Guggenheim Fellow, and she is Chair and Director of Sciences at Pioneer Works, a cultural center in Brooklyn. And we couldn't ask for a better guide to help us navigate the strange world of black holes. I'm eager to hear her talk tonight about her latest book, Black Hole Survival Guide. Jana, we're waiting. <laughs> Thank you, Shep. Oh, that was so sweet. Um, God, I just remember Shep getting me through graduate school. That's all I can say. <laughs> Making me laugh when I wanted to cry. 
Um, it's wonderful to be here. I uh, really appreciate uh, people supporting their local and landmark bookstores like Harvard Bookstore, which was really a staple. Uh, even even way back when, when when Shep and I <laughs> were in graduate school, I, I actually don't know if people have seen a copy of the book, so I I want to sh I want to show you because it's so wee little. <laughs> Where is it? Oh, you can kind of see it. So. Um, it reminds me of this Mark Twain quote where he said, I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. And I feel like that's what this book was like. I, I started with a lot of material and I needed to spend the time to write a very short book. Uh, and my uh, publisher, my editor, Dan Frank of Knopf, decided on the sweet little size for the book and we decided on the length that we would really aim to make it as lean as possible. And when I realized was I was nearing the end of writing this book that I wanted it to be an object, uh, uh, to be this beautiful little physical thing. And I invited my friend Leah Halloran, who's a wonderful artist, to make original paintings for me instead of doing regular figures. So every image you're gonna see in the talk tonight like this one here, this black hole I'm gonna fall into, uh, is one of Leah's paintings. And, um, and it made it very special special for me to, to finish this book and to have it physically in my hands. I'll spend a lot of time tonight, most of our time tonight, trying to dispel some of the myths about black holes. And to begin, I want to emphasize that a black hole is not an object which is often how we think of it. It's not a thing in the traditional sense. In some sense, a black hole is more of a place. If you were to go up to a black hole, you would not knock onto the surface of a very dense object. It's really not an object in space time, it is a space time. And so we're gonna spend some time unpacking that. How a black hole is a place, it is a space time. And in a lot of ways, we think of a black hole as a dead star, and that's certainly one way to make a black hole, but the black hole is not synonymous with being a dead star. In some profound sense, there's really truly nothing there. And uh, to understand space-time and to understand curved space-time, uh, it's actually not as surreal as you might imagine. It's incredibly, mathematically challenging, but the intuition that Einstein came up with when he thought about space-time was, was, was quite natural. It was, it was quite direct. So how do I know that space-time is curved? Uh, it's actually quite clear that space-time is curved in some sense. If you were floating in empty space and you were completely alone in utter darkness, and there was nothing else there, no earth, no sun, no moon, no galaxy, no planets, and you just started throwing stuff. You just threw stuff around. <laughs> you would find that these probes that you were throwing, if they helpfully illuminated their path, would travel on straight lines. And that space-time is in fact completely flat. Flat meaning there are no curves when things fall freely in the absence of other forces in an empty space. And suppose you were there with another astronaut. Suppose you had a companion, Alice. You and Alice could disagree on a lot of things. You might disagree on up and down. You might disagree left and right. That kind of relativism we're accustomed to. You could even disagree on which one of you was actually in motion. And the relativity of motion is actually a very profound concept that comes into the building of the whole theory of relativity. But you would all agree that free particles falling freely in the absence of other forces travel on straight lines in an empty space. And you, my friends who are out there, I hope there are people out there, are not living in an empty space. You live around the earth most predominantly. And you notice that things don't travel on straight lines around the earth. Suppose you're sitting in your living room from your couch, you can do this experiment. You can throw objects. Maybe you're fed up with the election cycle, the news cycle, and you throw your remote control at the television news, you notice it travels on an arc. It does not travel on a straight line. And this is very simple intuition that what is happening is when things fall freely, they follow the natural curves in space. The earth itself is creating a curved space time around it. And, uh, and that is evidenced by our everyday experience if, if, you, if you pause to do the thought experiment. Now, it's not just the Earth, obviously, it's the moon, it's the sun, it's even you and me, we create gravitational 
effects around us and we deform space time around us. But gravity is staggeringly weak. It's actually impressively weak. I can, I can lift this book with my, my little wee little arm, even though uh, the entire earth is pulling on me. And so we don't notice our effects on space time. We only notice the effects of space time of very large and very heavy things. Now, what's a little more subtle is the idea that the earth not only warps space, it also warps time. And this is a real effect that's not natural for us to notice, but we definitely have it affecting our daily lives. If you and Alice are on two different free fall paths through space time, you not only experience different free fall curves, but you will actually find that the rate at which your clocks tick are not in sync. You'll find that there's a different passage of time for you and for Alice if you're falling freely along different curves in space time. This is evidenced by the fact that as you're closer to the earth, time dilates, it elongates, it's slower relative, for instance, to the communication satellites in a low earth orbit, which are ticking faster. And if you don't correct for that difference in the rate at which the clocks tick, any GPS based app like Uber or Google Maps where you're trying to find your directions through a city will not give you a accurate determination of where you are in space and time at all. Very inaccurate, it'd be off by kilometers. So we have to correct for the relativistic warping and dilation of time in even our basic, what has become our everyday lives in just using things like phones. Now, it's not just objects like people and heavy things that experience curves in space, even light is following a curved path in space time. Now, it's harder to notice. If you shine a flashlight in your apartment, you don't see it fall to the ground the way you do if you threw your remote control across the room, which you would see trace this nice simple arc in space. It would look as though the light was traveling in a straight line, but that's only because light is going so fast at the cosmic speed limit, the speed of light. And uh, the faster I throw something, even that remote control, the less I'm able to notice the curve and the path that it's taking. There's a beautiful piece of history here where in 1919, Eddington, Arthur Eddington, who was a pacifist and an astronomer in England, about six months after World War I, under the devastation that, that, that was across Europe after World War I, he led an expedition to go view the eclipse, a total eclipse of the sun. And the purpose of this expedition was to measure if light in fact was traveling along a curved path. And he leads this expedition, it's go, the, the totality of the eclipse moves across a swatch of the globe, uh, across Africa, a part of Brazil. He has a team in Brazil. He himself goes to Principe, an island off Africa. It is raining during the eclipse. The total eclipse only lasts for a few minutes, seven minutes, and the eclipse already underway, the clouds break, and they're able to make an observation. Now, the eclipse is important because it blocks out the blinding light of the sun. And what they were looking for was a faint star cluster, Hyades, which was hiding exactly behind the sun from the point of view of the earth. So imagine this star cluster emitting light directly behind the sun. That light would not make it to the earth. The, the light should, in, if space time is not curved, fall into the sun, it would be blocked out by the moon, it would be dark. But instead what happens is the light, and you can kind of see it here, I feel like, I feel like a weather girl here. <laughs> uh, the light actually follows a bent path and falls into the eye, in this case of our astronaut. And that astronaut then has the illusion that the star is actually displaced from, this is a star cluster, displaced from where we know it is astronomically. So they measured the deflection of light because of the curved space time around the sun. And there's some controversy about the data and how clean it was and how easy it was to analyze. But moreover, here was a British scientist right after World War I proving a German scientist's 
incredibly exciting ideas. And these two countries had been bitter enemies just six months earlier. So it was this, it was this kind of pacifist gesture. And in fact, when Eddington comes back and reports, it makes headlines and it really catapults Einstein's fame in the English speaking world. So we know that space time affects light and matter. And it's really a way to think about it is that all mass and energy curve space time and all mass and energy fall along those curves in space time. And there are many such curves. Here, if you imagine something like um, the International Space Station, the International Space Station, some people have the idea that, oh, those astronauts are floating in the International Space Station because they're so far from the Earth that they no longer feel the effects of the Earth. That's actually not the case at all. They 100% feel the effects of the Earth. What's happening, they're about 400 kilometers up in, in a low Earth orbit, and they're going so fast. Um, it's something I, I, I try not to do mild, forgive me, but it's something like a little under eight kilometers a second that it's traveling. Once they're up in that orbit, they turn off the engines. They are no longer burning fuel. What the International Space Station is doing there is it is falling freely along a natural curve around the Earth. And that curve happens to be a circle. They're going along this beautiful curve, so they're falling and falling and falling, but in such a way that they always clear the horizon and they never crash into the surface of the Earth. So when you see the astronauts in the space station and they look like they're floating, they are floating. They're floating because they're falling. They're absolutely falling, but they're not floating because they're not feeling the gravitational effects of the Earth. They, they certainly are. If you were to stop that International Space Station, it would drop to the Earth like a stone. Another example of a different curved path, it looks quite straight, but that's a path in this space time, is when we try to launch things off the Earth. It takes uh, about a velocity of about 11 kilometers per second to launch spacecraft off the Earth if you give them just one push. And, um, and this is a perfectly valid path uh, of uh, trying to escape the curved space time of the Earth. Now, there is a moment where if I made the Earth really, really dense and small, some sinister evil genius came along and made the Earth uh, 18 millimeters across, the entire Earth, the entire mass of the Earth, 18 millimeters across, it would be the case that this escape velocity would exceed the speed of light. And we know that nothing can exceed the speed of light. And so as a result, nothing could escape a collapsed earth that was only 18 millimeters across. And what we really mean by that is we've, we've turned the earth into a black hole and the earth would go dark because not even light can escape. So that's really what we mean by a black hole. We mean that this region where uh, you have become unable to escape the curved space-time um, and you are, you are fated to only fall in. Now, in a weird way, what, uh, in, in the spirit of dispelling myths, the space station would be perfectly fine. It could still orbit right there. So this, this kind of impression of black holes as weapons of, of, of mass destruction of, and, and uh, implementing mayhem wherever they go is, is not totally deserved. You would actually be quite fine out there. Of course, it would be ca catastrophically cold and dark, but the space station itself could survive out there for a very, very long time. Let me see if I can keep going, sorry. Now, this speaks to our first slide, which in some sense, summarizes the entire title. Here we have an astronaut and explorer um, who is veering close to something who had, which has become so small that not even light can escape. And um, it was very interesting, again, the history of this. Einstein receives a letter within six months of him publishing his general theory of relativity, his theory of curved space time. And that letter has in it a mathematical solution, which, which at the time was not called a black hole, but which we now know um, is a black hole. And his friend writes him from the Russian front during World War II. 
And he says to Einstein, the war has treated me kindly enough. I have uh, had the opportunity and the pleasure to walk through the land of your ideas. And he presents what we now call the first black hole solution. Einstein's very impressed with this, but you have to think of it this way. What Schwarzschild did is he, he said, pretend, pretend all the mass is crushed to a point of a star, of a planet, let's just say. He doesn't say how. He doesn't say that it's possible to do such a thing. He just says, imagine it's crushed to a point. And therein he discovers really the basis of everything that follows that took 50 years to earn the moniker, the name black holes. Um, and Einstein's very impressed with the solution and he helps him present the work. But he says, nature will protect us from their formation. He doesn't think they're gonna occur in the actual universe. He thinks it's a mathematical oddity and a consequence of his theory he accepts, but he doesn't think it's gonna be possible. I mean, after all, it's very hard to crush things. You know, try crushing a book. <laughs> you cannot make it into a black hole as much as you try. It really has a lot of resistance. And, um, and so this went on for quite a while where people thought, well, this is beautiful math, but it won't be possible in the universe. And then nature, thinks of a way to make black holes. And that's just so impressive. Sometimes I wonder as a physicist, if every mathematical possibility will be realized in nature because nature will find a way to make it real. Nature thinks of a way to make black holes and that is by killing off a few stars, <laughs> a lot of stars, millions, billions of stars. And they have to be very heavy, massive stars. So if a star is heavy enough, at the end of its life cycle, when it no longer has the stamina to support itself, it begins to collapse under its own weight, it begins to collapse gravitationally, and it will ultimately form a black hole. Now, the story of collapse was had many stops and starts. And it's very interesting because just last month, uh, Sir Roger Penrose won the Nobel Prize for work he did in the 1960s, which proved that if a star collapsed unhindered, it would not only, it would get to a point where it was so dense that the velocity to escape from it would exceed the speed of light. And if you drew a little area around it, you could call that what we now call the event horizon. That is the point of no return, the point where if you are closer than that, you will never escape. Now that seems to contradict what I said in the beginning, that black holes aren't dense things, but the black hole isn't the dense thing. The dense thing is the star. Now what Roger Penrose continued to prove was that it was inevitable that that star would continue to collapse. If it didn't continue to collapse, it would have to race outward at the speed of light just to stay at the event horizon. And that's not possible. So he proved that the only future for that collapsing star, collapsing unhindered, was to continue to fall. And so what you really want to think about is that the star leaves behind the event horizon almost like an archaeological record, like an imprint in the space time, and then it's gone. The star is gone. So the actual event horizon, which is really what we mean when we say a black hole, is empty. It is nothing. There is nothing there. There is no material. It's a completely empty space time. Now, Penrose continues to say, well, the general theory of relativity, Einstein's theory, predicts in his calculation, which is also, by the way, miraculously concise. It's a, mirac it's a, it's a really masterful piece of work, uh, but he proves that inevitably that collapsing star will form a singularity. Now, a singularity is a region of infinite curvature in the space-time. And he goes on to say, I don't believe that this will really happen. I believe that this is general relativity signaling its demise. It is telling us that at those extreme curvatures, we must need to invoke something, and he conjectures, like a quantum theory, like a quantum theory of gravity. And so he, even though this beautiful paper predicts the inevitability of the singularity, he says, 
in reality, I bet they won't really form. I like to call them kind of a false prophecy of general relativity. So what we really mean by a black hole is we mean the event horizon. And so now this astronaut here who is trying to survive the black hole, this explorer is falling into what? He, the astronaut's falling into nothing. The astronaut is falling just into a region of space time that is radically curved. And all the astronaut is seeing in this image is the light illuminated from stuff outside the black hole. You have to think of the event horizon because it doesn't let even light escape as casting a shadow on the sky. So when we talk about the size, the extent of a black hole, we're really talking about the extent of the shadow. And, uh, and, and we need to illuminate um, around the black hole to be able to see that shadow. So let's take all the material away and just imagine we could draw the curves in the space time around the black hole. One of the things I really want, I would love for people to walk away with is to appreciate that black holes are nothing. There is nothing there. This astronaut could sail across the event horizon in a completely undramatic experience. They wouldn't know they had crossed the event horizon to some extent. There's no signposts there. There's no physicality there. And in fact, in some really profound way, um, black holes are perfect and they're featureless. And so there's this very pristine terrain that exists that is the black hole. And I also wanna emphasize that while collapsing stars is one avenue and the only one we actually know of in reality to creating a black hole, they are, dead stars are not synonymous with black holes. We can conceive of other ways uh, to make a black hole in the early universe, even maybe in a very high energy collider experiment, accelerator experiment, unlikely but possible um, in certain theories. And so yes, black holes form in the universe as the death state of stars, but they are not solely dead stars. In some sense, they're more fundamental than that, this perfect, pristine, featureless terrain. I think the smallest black hole theoretically conceivable would be one made in the very, very earliest moments of the universe. It could weigh as much as about a pile of flour, but it would be trillions and trillions and trillions of times smaller than a proton. So the walk away lesson is that black holes are heavy, but they are tiny. They are very small. Now, in reality, I, you know, we were joking earlier, I kind of want to fall into this black hole. In reality, space-time is not painted helpfully with the curves that we fall along. The astronaut, in reality, would actually see this. This would be the astronaut falling into a black hole. If there's nothing else in the universe, no more debris, nothing to light it up, the black hole is completely dark on the outside. And, um, and so if you wanna survive <laughs> traveling in dark, empty space that's littered with black holes, I highly recommend you bring a really powerful flashlight because otherwise you will not be able to know that the black hole is even there. You would see nothing. And because the event horizon is an empty region of space, you wouldn't necessarily even notice you had crossed. Um, the one-way window of the event horizon traps you once you cross, but it doesn't announce your approach. So one of the experiments, this has really been a century for black holes. It's been incredible. And one of the experiments that uh, contributed to the major discoveries this century was the LIGO experiment which detected the first completely bare black holes. As far as we understand, the black holes that this experiment LIGO detected were uh, completely dark. They, they, had no, they were like this. They had nothing around them, but they were swirling and orbiting each other. Now, if you imagine each black hole is able to curve space-time, as they move, the curves in space-time want to try to adjust to follow the motion of those black holes. So what happens is they're like mallets on a drum. They ring space time and it literally deforms the shape of space. If you were this astronaut, you might notice that you're starting to undulate, that your free fall path is changing. 
even more dramatic, you might actually hear it. You might actually hear the ringing of the drum of space time because your ear mechanism is designed to be more responsive to, to stresses than the rest of you. So if you're out there, you know, survival tip, and you're hearing a sound that's characteristic of the collision of two black holes, you probably want to get out of there. Now, in the, in the actual progression, scientific progression, uh, after Sir Roger Penrose's important work, which could be summarized as saying he proved that black holes were inevitable, that they weren't just a quirk of this very special solution that appeared in this letter in 1916 to Einstein, but that they were an inevitable consequence of the collapse of stars. Uh, in the decades that followed, we began to see indirectly black holes. We began to see black holes creating mayhem around them, which is where they get this reputation of weapons of destruction. And uh, in this beautiful painting by Leah is illustrated jets, which are a very uh, interesting characteristic. Jets can happen when a black hole is in a magnetic field and it creates a kind of a magnetic storm. It twists up these magnetic fields and it's cannibalizing maybe a neighboring star. And that's creating the opportunity for, for all of that pieces of the star. It's like pulling it off like tufts of cotton candy. And it's creating these dramatic jets. We've seen jets, not just from cannibalized stars, but from huge black holes in the centers of galaxies. We've seen jets so big that they are millions of light years across. They break out of their own galaxy. We've even seen examples where the jets have punctured neighboring galaxies, presumably wiping out exoplanets and any emergence of life on those planets. So the jets are actually quite lethal. They're like, they're like, astronomical ray guns. So if you are an explorer and you're near a black hole and you see something like one of these jets, you do not want to get in the way of the jet. It's going to be throwing x-rays and gamma rays and uh, you would be irradiated and with it would come all the uh, unspeakable consequences to your survival if you were in the direct hit of an x-ray. and uh, the first time we ever actually saw a black hole, and this is uh, one of these things that's really funny when I would say to friends, you know, we've never seen a black hole. <laughs> we've only seen them indirectly. And then we heard them with LIGO, which was a very direct detection. We, it was invis we couldn't see it with telescopes. We could only hear it with this enormous antenna. Um, but the first time was actually Shep's work. And, and this is, was, was a very special um, reveal because I remember when Shep first became interested in this kind of a subject of, of doing this kind of a work. Uh, the idea was to try to build a telescope the size of the earth. And it was over 20 years I saw Shep push that project forward just relentlessly. And this is one of the things, the tenacity of scientists, even when they're not sure they're gonna succeed. So it was only in April 10th, 2019, just last year, that Shep stood up and made the announcement. Um, it was at the National Press Club and I went, and I remember there were tags in each tag. There's scientist, journalist, and I think guest or something. I think I picked up one of each. <laughs> and um, and the, the, the exciting thing is that everyone thought that the Event Horizon Telescope was going to take a picture, an actual picture of the event horizon. Now, how do, you, how, do you, how do you take a picture of an event horizon? It's dark against a dark sky. You have to hope that it's helpfully illuminated by something. And in this case, there's bright material that swirls around the black hole. Now, imagine Saturn's rings and this bright material is swirling around in Saturn's rings. Um, that would not be sufficient to cast the shadow of the event horizon. You still wouldn't be able to see it. You would just see the ring and you would just see the ring kind of like on edge. But it uses the same physical phenomena that they used in the eclipse expedition a hundred years earlier. Uh, it was the same bending of the path of light 
So it was in the centenary of that 1919 eclipse, which is just a beautiful thing. So the light from this hot disk of swirling material appears both above and below the black hole. And that's why you get this, this helpful illumination and you get to see the shadow. And so why was this so hard? This was so hard because black holes are heavy, but small. If I was to turn the sun into a black hole tomorrow, the same evil genius that destroyed the earth decides to destroy the sun, turns the sun into um, a black hole. Um, it would only be six kilometers across. It would fit in a city. It would be smaller than a city. And so that is, it is, is a stunning challenge. Even Sagittarius A star, which is the name we assign to the supermassive black hole that lives in the center of our galaxy, it's 4 million times the mass of the sun, but it's 26,000 light years away. And it's, all, it's less than 20 widths of the sun across. So imagine taking something 4 million times the mass of the sun, but less than 20 widths of the sun across and pushing it to 26,000 light years away. We're talking about something smaller than our solar system. And you're trying to detect it. And it was an incredibly challenging experiment. It required the coordination of telescopes around the globe. And it uh, returned this stunning, um, well, it didn't actually. I've got to correct myself. It didn't return the stunning image because that's what I expected. So when I go on April 10th, 2019 to the National Press Club, and I'm watching Shep with the big reveal, the, excite, the, the real surprise at the end, the twist and the turn was that it was a different black hole. It was M87, the huge black hole in the center of a neighboring galaxy. That black hole is billions of times the mass of the sun. It's 55 million light years away. So it's actually on the sky about the same size. And so it was incredibly exciting that we actually saw a black hole in another galaxy. Now, um, let's see, can I forward this? Um, so, you know, if you want to be the first human to see a black hole with the unaided eye, you have to get pretty close because they're so small and, there's, and therefore so hard to see. You want to get pretty close, but not too close. And uh, even if it doesn't have the black hole, a big accreting disk around it or a whole bunch of hot matter, if there's a black hole between you and that, imagine that beautiful milky riff of stars that defines our view of the Milky Way, you would still see the shadow cast by the black hole because it would disturb the image of all the distant stars in the Milky Way. So you could know that you were there. And um, if you keep the safe distance, you actually could survive out there. You just don't get too close. And you actually can get a lot closer to a black hole than you can get to the sun and be safe. So black holes aren't these um, destructive uh, beasts that they're sometimes portrayed as. Now, suppose you and Alice are out there, you make this journey out to some black hole somewhere in the universe. You want to be the first ones to see it with the unaided eye. You can set up a nice simple orbit like the International Space Station does. And in fact, you can get incredibly close to the black hole. Suppose the black hole, for the sake of argument, is 10 times the mass of the sun. And that would mean it was only 60 kilometers across. Just think about how small that is. And if your orbital height was at least 60 kilometers away from the event horizon, you would um, be able to set up a nice stable orbit or more. You could go further out, but that's the closest you could get in. So you could imagine building a space station, sitting back, eating some popcorn, <laughs> play some music, and you could watch the whole display unfold. Things falling into the black hole, getting bright and dramatic as they do, maybe jets bursting out, but just keep that safe distance and you would be totally fine. Now, if you imagine instead that you're a little more adventurous and you decide to leave Alice behind and maybe um, you're a little less attached 
to this whole survival thing, <laughs> um, then, uh, then you could have a pretty spectacular if uh, doomed experience, if fatal experience. So what would happen if Alice stayed back safely in her orbit in the space station and you decided to make the plunge? As you moved closer and closer to the black hole, just like with the Earth, the black hole would deform the nature of time as well. And your clocks, including your biological clock, would appear to Alice to run very slowly, slower and slower as you got closer to the black hole. And eventually, as you were sending signals through light pulses back to Alice, she would receive a last one. There would come a time where you were so close to the event horizon that not even light can escape right when you hit the event horizon. And so you can imagine, it's actually a beautiful phenomenon that if you emitted a little pulse of light right at the event horizon as you were crossing, it would try to race out at the speed of light, but it wouldn't be able to leave the event horizon. It would get stuck there. Now, light always has to travel at light speed. So in your experience, as you crossed into the event horizon, it would be like a waterfall of space time. And you would see that little pulse of light. You would see it as though it was traveling at the speed of light. But Alice would never receive it. It would be like a fish swimming against the Niagara. Now, like the star, you are forced to cross that event horizon. You can no more stay there than you could travel at the speed of light. You are forced to fall inward. And uh, the singularity, which is your fate, is unavoidable. Now, Alice, from the outside, looking at this black hole that is about 60 kilometers across, might imagine that that singularity is at the center of a sphere. But from your point of view, the singularity is actually in your future. It's as though time has rotated for relative to space, Alice's space, so much that space and time have switched places inside the black hole. And from your experience of clocks and your measures of space with rulers, the singularity is in your future. You can no more avoid the singularity than you can avoid the next moment in time. Now, that uh, seals your fate. That means there is no escaping a pretty catastrophic fate. Your initial cross, uh, 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 your initial transit across the event horizon might be very unspectacular. You might not even notice it happened. You are noticing that Alice's clocks are speeding up. You've noticed that Alice has succumbed to old age and passed on and maybe she has clones and they keep observing you and you keep trying to communicate, but even they come and go with so such rapidity that by the time you cross the event horizon, um, you're very much alone in there. <laughs> and yet one of the other myths I wanted to spell is, is that black holes, while dark on the outside, are not dark on the inside. They can be bright on the inside. So as you fall and you're approaching the singularity in your future, light from the galaxy can fall in behind you, lighting up the interior of the black hole. In fact, if there is light coming in from the galaxy, you're gonna see a bright flash of light as you approach that singularity. I call it like a near death experience, except it's a total death experience. <laughs> and um, so if you want to avoid this black hole in your future, you really cannot, but you can elongate your lifespan if you fall into as big a black hole as possible. The bigger the black hole, the more time you'll have. If you fall into black hole tens of billions of times the mass of the sun, you might get nearly a year out of it before you are uh, in that storm of the extreme space time and your ligatures are pulled apart by the curvature and you are flayed as has been well described in many other um, venues about black holes and your bits would fall apart and who knows what happens to them in the end. But for the sake of science, you should record your year long experience and uh, try to overcome your existential dread. Some people imagine that in the interior of a black hole is actually a whole new big bang, that all of your fundamental bits that get flayed blow out into a new universe, a new ecosystem where maybe there are new black holes and you become part of a whole fertile new story. That is not incredibly 
popular among scientists at the moment, but I still love the idea. It reminds us that the black hole could be, let's say it's 60 kilometers across on the outside, could be as big as a universe on the inside. Black holes can be bigger on the inside than they are on the outside. It's like the ultimate Doctor Who's TARDIS. Now, to some extent, at this point, we're getting to what I call the hard stuff. <laughs> and that there's, there's a reason why you should, you should send those transmissions when you're falling inside the black hole to your death, <laughs> where you think you are sealed forever behind the black hole, where nothing can escape, not your transmissions, not your story, uh, not the recordings you're trying to send home. There's a reason why you should do it anyway, because there's a thin vapor of hope that maybe that information would get out. And this begins with Sir Roger Penrose's good friend, Sir Stephen Hawking. So Stephen Hawking realized something quite extraordinary. He said, yes, the event horizon is empty. It is nothing. It is a vacuum, it is empty space. But even nothing has a little bit of frothy quantum sea of virtual particles. Now, I go in the book uh, into some depth about this, but just to state the facts for the, for the sake of uh, not having a four hour <laughs> lecture, this frothing quantum C allows for particles matched in pairs that neutralize each other to kind of come and pop in and out of existence is the loose way of saying it. The black hole has this trick. It can steal one behind the event horizon, exposing the, the, the partner pair the partner in the pair. And it steals one of the particles, that particle falls in inevitably as does everything else, but the one that's left on the outside can no longer return to the vacuum from which, from which it came and is free to escape. And that is the Hawking radiation. So the important thing to think about here is that the, the Hawking radiation comes from outside the black hole. It does not come from inside the black hole. So many people have heard the story that a black hole evaporates through Hawking radiation and eventually it will completely evaporate. The entire event horizon will be yanked up. And yet none of that evaporating radiation came from inside the black hole. So you've yanked up the event horizon and exposed the interior and all of the stuff that fell inside is just gone. Now, this is a very serious problem. <laughs> because it says that the laws of physics in some sense are broken. If this were true, it would suggest that there are, are unknowable things, that information could fall out of the universe. The entire quantum paradigm is designed to respect the preservation of information. That's the whole program. We have information, we predict things with that information. The idea that you could yank up the event horizon and the information is gone is, 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 was a horror to physicists. And for 40 years, for 50 years, scientists have found what is now called the information loss paradox to be one of the most profitable, provocative uh, ideas and suggestions in the history of fundamental physics. For a long time, people knew, okay, it's bad that there's maybe a singularity on the inside, and, but you know what, the event horizon, it, it, it performs a kind of censorship. It protects us from all that bad nonsense going on in the interior of the black hole. We don't ever need to know about that, who cares? Because we'll never know about it anyway. Well, now this is terrible because you've revealed what was going on inside and what you found um, quite terribly is that you don't understand what goes on inside. So a, a debate began, a war began, sometimes referred to as the black hole wars between the relativists who believed in the sanctity of the event horizon and the quantum theorists who believed in the sanctity of information. One of them had to give. Either things could come out of the event horizon and information could escape, or quantum mechanics was going to lose information. And so this went back and forth for a long time, but I, I say it's incredibly productive and provocative because it led to some of the most exciting ideas that are still very speculative today, but I love to talk about because this is where we are really at the moment. And one of the fascinating ideas that came out of this was the idea of black hole holography. The idea was, well, maybe we should forget about the interior altogether. 
maybe everything that falls into the, into the black hole in some sense encodes its information only on the surface of the event horizon, which isn't a physical surface, it's just a region of space-time. But maybe all of that information is really just encoded on the surface and the interior, it's an illusion. And the reason it's called holography is because that's how a hologram works. You encode all the information on a two-dimensional surface and it projects the illusion of a three-dimensional image. So the argument was maybe fundamentally in some sense, black holes are only two-dimensional and, and that the whole concept of them being three-dimensional is an illusion. Now this goes further, just tangentially to give a little aside. If I try to pack more information than I can pack into a black hole, I will fail because I will make a black hole. So what it means is nothing in the universe has more information than can be encoded on its boundary. And so there is this, this, this very dreamy suggestion that the entire universe is a hologram. Now that's wild, but it began to gain some, well, first of all, intuitively, these were very intuitive ideas and the people originally working on it were really, it was like gut instinct and lots of intuition very clever thought experiments, but then came something very close to a mathematical proof, a proof so strong that even Stephen Hawking conceded because he was on the gravity side. He was on the general relativity side. He was taunting the quantum theorists and he thought he would prevail. He thought that, gra that, that the event horizon would prevail and information was lost for a long time. And he conceded because of this proof. Now this proof um, is, it's quite spectacular, but what is imagined in this proof? It's a very formal mathematical proof, but I will, I will describe it in analogy. Imagine a universe, a three-dimensional world. And in that world, there's gravity, there's black holes, there's some quantum mechanics, there's some matter, there's an information loss paradox that physicists are struggling to try to understand. Now imagine this three-dimensional world lives inside a box. And on the boundary of this box, is only quantum mechanics. It feels like another world. It's only two dimensional. It's the boundary of the three dimensional world. And it has no gravity in it, no black holes, and therefore no information loss paradox. There's no such crisis in this world. Now the remarkable proof suggested that there was a duality between these two worlds. That in fact, they were simply the same world, but in a different description. Now that's a beautiful example of holography. It says that the world on the boundary is sufficient to explain the entire world inside the box. And that entire world, therefore, could not possibly lose information because there was a direct mathematical dictionary from one to the other. Now, this is still very much um, in, in process and, and very much a, a very active area of research. But that led a lot of people to say, oh, wow, this is gonna turn in the favor of the quantum theorists. However, we still don't know how it happens. When we look at a black hole evaporating, we don't know how the information gets out, even if we believe that it must. And one of the craziest ideas, just as we come to the close of this, uh, conversation is that one of the craziest ideas is that, well, maybe there are these quantum wormholes and these quantum wormholes connect the interior of the black hole to the outside of the black hole so that the radiated particle, the Hawking radiation is actually the same particle as the one that fell in. And if you have this entangled sea of these, um, this, these crazy overlapping, quantum entang entangled wormholes, you might be able to actually say the interior is also the exterior of the black hole. And so this is why you should send your transmissions as you're going to your death. Because if Alice and her clone descendants are faithfully recording the Hawking radiation, and that Hawking radiation is actually encoded with your information because it's connected to the interior of the black hole through wormholes, I just said that sentence, then Alice could actually reconstruct all of your messages in principle. And she could hear your story and your scientific discoveries and, and the messages you wanted to send home. And she could even, in the most fantastical variant of the story, 
rebuild you. So even your death was, was not permanent. And, um, and people go so far as to wonder in these very new, very speculative ideas, but very quick paced field, if in fact, the whole idea of the black hole only exists as emerging from these entangled wormholes. If you think of how embroidery and overlapping stitching creates the illusion you can make a black hole out of embroidery, but really on closer inspection, it's really just a bunch of threads. And in some sense here, the threads would be the wormholes. And so while I've really brought you to the brink of my own understanding, certainly of black holes, and I believe of anyone's, <laughs> unless somebody's writing a paper right now that's going to <laughs> dispel all the illusions. The important thing to think about from black holes is that they're not just astrophysical objects. They're not just dead stars. That is only one way to make them. They're actually perfect fundamental particles in some sense. They're flawless. I shouldn't really, in some sense, we can think of them as gravitational particles, but I really would like to think of them as this perfect flawless terrain on which we've been able to explore not just in astrophysics, but even just in the terrain of our minds, the very fundamental laws of reality. And I thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope there's people out there. And um, I'd love to turn it over to Shet for some Q&A. Okay, let's have a, a round of virtual applause for Jana. That was a, a stunning, stunning talk. Uh, really, really beautiful. <laughs> I have um, to try to find, yeah, there you are. Yeah, so we have we have some questions here. I'm gonna start reading them, some, some great questions here. Uh, and I have a couple of my own, but I wanna get through these first too. Uh, so Glenn uh, asks, uh, is there either a theoretical upper limit to the size of a black hole? And are there different species of black holes? Uh, can they have different masses with different characteristics that are distinct from smaller mm -hmm. mass black holes? These are both very good questions. So, so in principle, a black hole in principle can be as big as the observable universe in which it lives, in principle. Um, it can't be bigger than that because that would mean that somehow something was bigger than light was able to, you know, it would be, it wouldn't be, you couldn't causally do something like that. It would require faster than light travel. So, so as long as it's smaller than the size of the observable universe, however big that universe is, there's really no limit to how big a black hole can be. Now in our universe, in reality, it's expanding, as you all know, Shep. And so there's a competition, right? You know, the old Woody Allen line, like he doesn't want to do his homework because he's freaking out because the universe is expanding. His mom says, you live in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is not expanding. <laughs> so Brooklyn isn't expanding because the gravitational pull of the earth on itself is stronger than the local expansion. But there will, there might come a time where those are in competition. Um, but the, but the, in some sense, the more profound issue is about the features, whether it can be distinct. And black holes are really impressive in this way. It, they have to be featureless. If a black hole, if you tell me the black hole's mass, you tell me it's electric charge, and you tell me it's spin, that black hole is identical to every other black hole with those same numbers, with that same mass mm -hmm. charge and spin. It is indistinguishable and it has to be that way because the event horizon does not allow me to see differences. It hides behind the event horizon. I don't care if that thing was made out of the Oxford English Dictionary, bars of gold, donkeys, I don't know what, stars, dark matter. It doesn't matter. For dark matter is not charged, so okay. So it doesn't matter. All you can tell is its mass, spin and charge. And so that makes black holes very different than anything else in the universe. Every neutron star, which is a dead star that doesn't quite become a black hole, is slightly different than every other neutron star. They are not, in that sense, this fundamental featureless terrain the way the black holes are. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, that, that's remarkable. I, I marvel at the fact that you can have tiny black holes and black holes that weigh billions of times the mass of the sun, and they're all fundamentally identical. So that's what we're finding out. That's it's right. like a, a mouse being the same as an elephant. You know, it's, it's I, I, true. I totally, I love it saying that. And when we calculate, and Shep, you well know this, we sometimes, we do so in a way where we don't really care what the specific mass is at all. It's all the same. At the end of the day, we put the mass in for some sense of scale, 
but a, a tiny black hole is just scaled version of a big black hole. They're mm -hmm. not different in kind at all. And so we don't even worry about these features of, about something like the mass when we're calculating in the abstract. It's only at the end of the day when we want to know, well, how big is it really? That it's this big or it's this big or it's bigger. So they scale exactly as the mass. In other words, uh, the sun is six kilometers across if it's collapsed to a black hole. Uh, a, a black hole 10 times the mass of the sun is 60 kilometers across. 100 times the mass of the sun is 600 kilometers across, et cetera. And they're just perfect scaled versions. One black hole fits all. So let, let, let's get to some other ones here. Um, Stanley asks, uh, how can we learn more about black matter and black energy? I guess dark matter, and dark energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, just about that. I uh, can riff on that. Uh, just a bit. <laughs> so there was some speculation when LIGO made its first detection. So the, the black holes LIGO detected, the first ones were tens of times the mass of the sun. It saw some smaller ones, and then it saw some much bigger ones in the range of 100 times the mass of the sun, which is very interesting. But people speculated, is it possible that these black holes are made of dark matter? And there's no reason why not. Dark matter is not as mysterious as people make out. We, dark matter just means it's a particle that doesn't interact with light. And we've seen examples of that before. Neutrinos, as many people have heard of, are passing through us right now from the sun and from space. And they're passing through our bodies because they're well aware that we are mostly empty space they just don't interact with our atoms very well, but they're just otherwise just particles. And so they feel gravity in exactly the same way as every other particle feels gravity. So there's no qualm making a dark matter black hole. It would be a little bit hard because dark matter doesn't tend to clump. It tends to be diffuse. And to make a black hole, you have to have something that collapses. And to collapse, things you know have to be able to cool off, and it's a whole complicated process. And because dark matter doesn't doesn't radiate with light, it doesn't cool off very easily. So we suspect that the dark matter is diffusely surrounding the galaxy, but it is not impossible that in some complicated dark matter model you could make big dark matter black holes. It's possible. It would not account for all the dark matter in the universe. We know that the numbers won't match up, but it could be part. It's not impossible. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so uh, Geneva asks, did the binary black holes in the LIGO experiment have accretion disks? It's a great one. It's a very good question. Honestly, we don't really know. I don't think we'd be able to see it from here. So we definitely didn't see anything. So far, there's this beautiful collaboration between LIGO and an entire network of telescopes. And so as soon as LIGO hears something, as soon as it starts to hear something, it triggers this network and it's like, you know, it moves over and tries to like look at it in all kinds of different wave bands. And so far, no telescope has ever seen a correlated event in light, which suggests that the black holes don't have matter around them. However, if you had an accretion disk like what you saw in M87, Chet, I don't believe in a million, I mean, I was gonna, it's gonna be, I don't believe that we could possibly detect it with the telescopes because those black holes were over a billion light years away. So I think the best thing we can say is it's they're not they're not exploding like neutron stars would have been fireworks. And in fact, we did see fireworks when neutron stars collided. So what, if there is any matter around it, there there may well have been none, but it's too faint to possibly see from this great distance. Yeah, yeah, we certainly didn't see any electromagnetic counterparts from those first right. binary black holes. And I, yeah, and I'll say something else that's really has always I've always it's always kind of blown me away is that the LIGO the first detection that LIGO made was the most powerful event we've ever detected since the Big Bang, and yet none of it came out in light. All of it came out, as far as we know in the ringing of space-time. So wow. this was an event more powerful than if you added all the power on, on all the stars shining in the universe combined, this one event. And so it is, it is really quite spectacular um, that LIGO has given us an ability to kind of, I like to call it recording the soundtrack of the universe after we've spent 300 years since Galileo taking pictures, right? Com composing a movie of it. Yeah, a real a real drum banging space time. 
So uh, truly, truly. So uh, Stephen, I'm not sure how much time we have left here, but the, the, the questions are mounting here. Stephen asks, if black holes evaporate over time, what does that mean for galaxies like ours that have an enormous black hole at the center of the galaxy? Does this black hole keep the galaxy bound together? Mm. So it's, we've known for a while, and it was a, quite a surprise. Everyone was kind of like, who ordered that? You know, these supermassive black holes were not anticipated. They're clearly not formed from one star. They're way too big. So did they form from a lot of collisions of black holes? Like LIGO detects collisions of black holes that merge in the main bigger black holes. Maybe that keeps happening, keeps happening. You do that a million times, you get a supermassive black hole. People aren't sure if there's enough time in the age of the universe for that to happen. Maybe they collapse directly just out of the primordial soup. But regardless, people thought, you know, even as heavy as they are, they're not that much the mass of the entire galaxy. So maybe they're not that important. But more and more, I think, I think most people would argue that the black holes actually sculpt the galaxy. It's because of these jets and the enormous storms it creates in the magnetic fields. And so it regulates how big a galaxy can grow. It helps clear out material. So our entire, here we are, this little solar system orbiting a super, we are in orbit around Sag A star, orbiting a supermassive black hole that may well be our history, right? It may well have shaped how we got here. Mm -hmm. And yes, ultimately, eventually we may fall in. It will be a very long time. Yeah, much yeah. longer you know the future they say is much longer than the past is the way to think about it true yeah i'm, I'm not afraid of the black hole in the center of the milky way galaxy i, I, I have afraid. to study it but we're not afraid of it yeah okay. <laughs> um so scott asks uh for he says hi from orlando uh what is the next big headline development for black holes what are you most excited about for the future of black hole science well there's a good one yeah well I'm hoping Shep is going to reveal a picture of Sagittarius A star, our own black hole one day. Look at how dead his face is going. He's not allowed to. <laughs> I say nothing, right? I, I, I can give nothing away. <laughs> Poker face. Um, wouldn't it be lovely to see our own black hole? And um, I do think that Shep was sweet to mention my research. Um, one of the reasons I work on that whole idea of a black hole battery is because they are by nature dark. That's the whole point. We believe that LIGO, when things are colliding, two black holes are colliding, that they are detecting dark black holes or black holes and neutron stars that you couldn't possibly see at such great, such great distances. So there's, there's part of me that hopes that the black hole becomes this battery, that it's going to be have an, just enough luminosity for maybe us to see a flash of light before a black hole swallows a neutron star hole. So, so that to me personally would be very thrilling. Yeah, and yeah. no doubt, I, I formally, you know, very much am very interested in the resolution of this paradox because I believe that we may be marching towards an idea that the black hole itself is, isn't fundamental, that the thing that's fundamental is actually quantum mechanics. And that chills me. And I, I, mm -hmm. I get to have sleepless nights over it. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it's uh, I, I, the other thing that's kind of cool is to think about making movies of black holes. So we might, I think that may be in our grasp. I'm not sure if the information paradox will be resolved, but we do what we can. No. Or are we, hopefully well, we're not out of time. Good point, oh. oh, just really quickly, a, 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 a good point to make for people is that People often think the bigger the black hole, the worse it is. It's actually the opposite. The bigger the black hole, the safer it is. Think about standing on a basketball where you really, you're really you teetering around because you really notice the basketball versus standing on the earth where you hardly notice. So the bigger a black hole you fall into, the safer you're gonna be, the longer you're gonna live, the less it's evaporating. It's really when you get to the smaller and smaller black holes that they become more lethal in that way and more immediately lethal. So if you were to make a black hole like in the laboratory, you really, want to watch out, like we, there are some arguments that maybe in an accelerator you make a black hole. You want to watch out because they're like little firecrackers when they get small. The Hawking evaporation gets faster and brighter. Mm -hmm. So you have somewhere between a firecracker and bombs going off. <laughs> so, um, so if you do want to make a black hole in the lab, you want to be aware that it's going to explode on you. Yeah, although I, I, I want to add that you know, when black hole scientists get together and the question comes up, well, would you jump into a black hole? 
there's a real hesitation. I mean, some people are like, I would just love to see what goes on in there, right? So, you know, maybe we'll play the odds and we'll come back out as Hawking radiation. I don't know. You better collect that Hawking radiation real good. <laughs> like, yeah. I, yeah. I, I want to be reconstituted. <laughs> and you're coding. You know, I don't want any code mistakes, man. It's not funny. I come back with like three arms or, or something weird like that. I just uh, want to give an update. You have like fi like five minutes left. Just giving okay. you a it's time. We, we just have another hour of content. So, so I know. <laughs> um, okay. I so, so Glenn asks, uh, well, we may have already, you may have already answered this one. He asked, would Alex, would Alice um, see you emerge in the black hole as Hawking radiation? I think you kind of said yes to that earlier, right? So, so she, it wouldn't be an easy task. It's a little, imagine I take the Oxford English Dictionary, which I particularly like to use that example because I love David Foster Wallace's essay on this. Um, so you take the Oxford English Dictionary and you burn it. In principle, that information is not lost, right? It's in the smoke, it's in the heat, it's in the ash. Now, obviously, in practice, it is completely untenable to imagine you're going to reconstruct the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> it's, it's a completely untenable task. You can even make very sophisticated arguments about how long it would take to decode, and it would be longer than the age of the universe. But you know, in the fantasy land, yes, in principle, you can take the Oxford English Dictionary and put it back together. Um, even though it seems like it's hopefully lost, it's not technically lost. And that's what this argument of the wormholes allows you to do is allows you to say it's not technically lost. It is like burning the Oxford English Dictionary, so it's not great. <laughs> and it's going to be an epic challenge. But in principle, the information is there. OK. I'm going to combine the next two questions uh, yeah. that may be related. Yeah. Their authors may yeah. be related, Jim and Julia Moylan. Uh, they ask, uh, since space and time invert inside the event horizon, would you be able to move freely in time the way we move freely in space outside the horizon? And then the related question is, would light still travel at light speed inside the black hole? Or would it travel at the inverse speed since space and time mm -hmm. have reversed? Well, so the, the, the trick about space and time being relative is all you ever have access to is your own. So if you believe that inside the black hole, you are now moving towards the future, what the person on the outside had imagined was a spatial direction, you know, the, the radius towards the center of the black hole, you now perceive as a direction in time, that's all you have access to. So it's not unusual for your passage of time completely normal. Your clocks tick at a normal rate. Your heartbeat is aligned, your biological clock, your personal aging. It's just relative to Alice that it's so extraordinarily strange. So, so no, you can no more move freely in your experience of time than Alice can. Uh, it doesn't buy you that, but it does, um, it does mean that exactly the opposite in some sense, that you might imagine, oh man, I'm inside the black hole. I'll just put on some brakes. I'll fire my jet pack. <laughs> and maybe I'll, I'll try to get into some kind of orbit. You can't do that because this is now the time direction. Mm -hmm. And because time behaves as time behaves for you, the same, you know, in that sense, the same as her time behaves for her, you are forced forward. And that is that. And, and, and what about the speed of light? Is the speed of light the same the in the black hole? of light and that's a beautiful thing and that's why i love this example of the speed of light right on the event horizon is that it can get stuck on the event horizon like a fish but it's going at the speed of light it mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. it's just mm -hmm. that the space time is like a waterfall washing down into the black hole at the speed of light mm -hmm. it, <laughs> so it happens the same yeah it, it, it's the same way with glass what was that Oh, no, so you can't see the little beam of light standing still because you can't stay stand still on the event horizon. You're dragged with the waterfall. So if you were to try to measure the speed of light of this thing that's stuck on the horizon, you would say it's the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. Yeah, it's a constant. It's the law. It's uh, the law. Let's keep going on the questions until they kick us off. Um, okay, so, one more. Let's do one more. Yeah, Kijia, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, says, uh, hello, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. When you talk about the size of black holes, for example, 60 kilometer wide black hole, is the diameter, is that the diameter of the event horizon? So since the black yeah. hole isn't an object, what does that distance refer to? So that distance, it's a good question. That distance just refers to the outer diameter of, and, and in fact, it's a little bit subtle. 
it's a little bit subtle, but it, it refers to what we call um, the outer diameter of the shadow. But lengths are funny in, in relativity. They're really funny. So imagine like um, a horn and how the outer perimeter, we, when we're talking about that, and we say, oh, that's a certain number of kilometers across. If you really talk about the lengths as you go inside, it's not just the distance right to the middle. It's this weird, long, loping distance. So in relativity, because of the curved space-time, because of the deformations of the shape of space-time, we know we have to be a little careful about distinguishing between what we're just calling the distance of the event horizon and what we would actually experience, like how, how long it actually is. But I would say backhand, you know, the backhand explanation is that what we mean is that's the diameter of the shadow cast by the black hole, this empty nothingness, there's nothing there, there's no surface. But when I talk about the size of a black hole and when you revealed that stunning image that a billion people watched simultaneously, what you were looking at was something that was in the case of this black hole. How heavy is it, Chet? Six billion times the mass of the sun? Is yeah, that about the right six, six and a half billion. Yeah. So six and that, a half billion that's times this one. the mass of the sun? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there it is behind you. Oh my gosh. So that makes it what? 36 billion kilometers across is the yeah. shadow that you measured. And that's yeah. solar system sized. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a few times the size of our solar system. It's, it's phenomenal to think about. You know, it was very special by the way that you were there with us to make that reveal. That was really something. It was, it was really lovely. It really was great. So I, I think that might be all the. All close. What's that? It's a perfect place to close. Yeah. So I think we might, so uh, that might be all the time we have. Thank you both so much for that incredible talk. Um, this was such a fascinating event and such a highlight of my week. Um, and so thank you both for being here and thank you everyone who attended and spent your evening with us. Uh, please feel free to learn more about this book and purchase Black Hole Survival Guide on harvard.com. I have included the link in the chat. Um, so on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science and Harvard Library, all located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good night, keep reading, preferably this book, and please be well, everyone. Take care. Okay. Take care. Bye, Jenna. Bye, Kate.